We're going to talk for just a moment now about closing. Let me define the difference now between a closed-end question and an opened-end question. A closed-end question is a question that you ask. The answer can be a yes or a no. Mrs. Jones, do the drapes day? Yes. See, it did not require any further conversation on her part, does it? Now, as an example, if you're previewing the home and you ask her a question like, have you ever sold another home through a realtor? And she says, yes. And you ask, did you have any problems with the sale at that time? And if she says, yes, we did, could you expand on that further for me, please? See, now you've went into an open-end question. Now it takes some conversation to answer that question, doesn't it? And now you're going to find out what problems they had with the sale of the property at that time. Depending on the situation, what her reasoning was or what the problems was they had, your answer could be something like, oh, gee, you know, we find this happens sometimes with new people in the business. And this is... <laughs> This is what I will do to make sure that doesn't happen again. Let's talk about the area of tie-downs. Closing has three phases. Your first phase is tie-downs, isn't it? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Your second phase is questions with alternate of choice answers. Mr. Jones, do you think that the for sale sign would look better on the left side of the lawn or on the right? See, that's an alternative choice. He's got two answers there. Now, what they'll do a lot of times is they'll try to be funny and say, why don't you put it in the middle? <laughs> Fine, let me jot that down. <laughs> let him win. Let him look good. See, as long as he's looking good, how do you look? You look good too. I'm going to give you some samples now of tie-downs. Isn't it? Wouldn't it? Couldn't it? Shouldn't it? Hasn't it? Don't you? Wouldn't you? Couldn't you? Shouldn't you? Haven't you? I want you just to write the word we. I want you to write the word they. Now, this is a teaching technique that I got from a professor at the University of Davis. This is going to give you about 10 more tie downs. Don't we? Wouldn't we? Couldn't we? Shouldn't we? Haven't we? See how we did that? And then the same with they. Don't they, wouldn't they, couldn't they, shouldn't they, haven't they. Right there you have 20 tie downs. Now, on the test tomorrow, when I say, write the 20 tie downs, I want the complete words on all the tie downs. I don't want we times five. I don't want <laughs> they times five. That will not get it. Now, let's talk for just a moment now about the types of closes. Number one is our order blank close. And any of you that are in the real estate business, I'm sure that you know what the order blank close should be. And this is our, what I refer to as a cooperative service agreement. You see, I don't like to use the word listing because to me a listing sounds like something that somebody's going to take back to the office and hang on a nail. I like the word cooperative service agreement because this means that there's cooperation between the two of us. Service means he's going to get something. And agreement means that we're in agreement on this. That's why I like the term cooperative service agreement. But to get back, this is your cooperative service agreement or your order blank close. You're touring the property and you say, Mrs. Jones, do the drapes stay? And she says, yes or no. You say, fine, let me jot that down. Where do you write it? On your cooperative service agreement or on your order blank. You see? Unless she throws up her hands and says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you doing? Well, I need some accurate information, don't we? You see, when you walk into somebody's house, and they, the big danger is that the first thing they say is, what do you think we can get for it? Well, it depends on what you're going to leave, doesn't it? See, you just can't walk into a home and give a snap decision because, and I'll say this, the biggest danger with most salespeople is that they give out a price. Now, you'll notice when I close this afternoon, closing the listing, the dialogue that I use and so forth, watch me very carefully. I never divulge a price that I think the property should be listed at. And the reason I say that, and I want you to be aware of it, is that 
a lot of times after the two-day seminar, somebody will be there with me and say, you know what? It just dawned on me that you never suggest a price to the seller of what the property should be listed at. So we've got a lot of traveling to go to find out how we do get there then, don't we? Would you like to know how we do that? Yeah. Would you pay more money? No. <laughs> so you ask a question, the answer to which she's going along with you, you jot it down on your cooperative service agreement. That's your order blank close. Questions with alternate of choice answers. So remember, tie downs is the first phase. What's the second phase? Alternate of choice, and then our final closing questions. Here's some examples of alternate of choice questions. Mrs. Jones, would you want us to call for an appointment before showing the home, or shall we just stop by? Would you prefer to have our agents tour the home this week, or would next week be better? Would you like me to have the for sale sign up right away? Or would you like a few days to tell the neighbors? May we have open house this weekend or would next weekend be better? Would you prefer to have multiple listing tour this week or would next week be better? See that answer to that. When she says, well, next week would be better, what do we do? Let me jot that down. Unless she stops you, what's happening? She's going along with you, right. Balance sheet close is also known as the Benjamin Franklin close goes like this and when you use the Ben Franklin close now myself in listing I'll be honest with you I never used it a lot but it's good to know these closes in that one time that you're out there that you could use it and you need it that's why you need to know these now the Ben Franklin close I found much more effective and much more usable when I was working with a buyer as an example trying to get the husband and wife together in decision on one property it was an excellent time to use the Ben Franklin close the type of person that you use the Ben Franklin clothes on and the situation would be something like this. You've got good rapport with them. You're going along, but they just can't make a decision. And now you're going to help them to make a decision uh, with this type of a situation. And they just can't give you a reason for not going along with you. So your dialogue would be something like this. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, we Americans have long considered Benjamin Franklin to be one of our wisest men. When old Ben was in a situation like you're in today, he felt pretty much about it as you do. If it was the right thing to do, he wanted to be sure and do it. Now, if it was the wrong thing to do, he wanted to be sure and avoid it. And here's what old Ben used to do. He would take a plain white sheet of paper, and you would take a plain white sheet of paper, and he would draw a line down the middle, and you draw a line down the middle, and he would put yes at the top of this column, and he would put no at the top of this column for those things favoring his decision and those things against his decision. Now, why don't we list the things favoring your decision and hand him your pen? Now, you give him all the help in the world. Don't you think this ought to go in? Don't you think this ought to go in? Don't you think this ought to go in? How about this? A full-time real estate professional, years of experience, all the things that we recapped and even more, relocation service, whatever it might be, the reasons why he should go along with you. Now, after you've done that, now I can normally end up with about 17 to 20 reasons why he should go along with me. When he's finished or you're finished with the things why he should go along with you, then you say to him, now why don't you see if you can think about reasons why you should not go along with me? And I assure you, you will never get more then three reasons on the no side. And then what do you do when you ask him to list those things with the no decision? Excellent. Let him sweat it out himself. <laughs> now, when he's exhausted and he can't go any further, you say, well, let's count up and see how we did. There's one, two, three, four, 15, 16, 17... There's 18 on this side. Let's count over here. One, two, three. Well, the answer is pretty obvious, isn't it, sir? By the way, did you want to give possession in 30 or 60 days? <laughs> you got to use them. You got to use them. And you've got to know these dialogues, too. Summary question closing. As an example, your summary question closing is a type, in the type of situation you would be using that would be the type of client that you visit with and he just won't go along with you but he cannot give you a reason for not going along 
type of a guy might be, well, we want to think it over. We're not the kind to make a decision right now. You know, we'll let you know in the morning. You know the thing that kills salespeople? It's not the guy that says, yes, we'll list with you. Now, I've never really had him jump up and down quite like that, folks, to be honest with you. But that's not the type of person that will kill salespeople. It's not even the type of person that will reach across the table and grab your tie and say, look, butcher, we don't want to list with you. We can handle that. It's the guy that says, well, we'll let you know. Does that sound familiar? It's those type of people that kill salespeople. Because what you find is in about 30 to 60 days, particularly those of you that are getting in the business, you may not even have anything put together at that time, but you've got all these possibilities that you're juggling around. And then before you look back, they're starting to fall all around you. you say, My gosh, he's, that guy lied to me. <laughs> you can't believe a thing they say. And probably the reason they do that to begin with is that you did not give them enough reason to go ahead with you at that time. Getting back to the story here of this summary question closing, when he says to you, we want to think it over, you say, that's fine, sir, and I think that you should. Just to clarify my thinking that I may better serve you, what phase of the program is it you wish to think over? Is it the price we're offering the property for sale? Is it the terms we're offering the property for sale? Is it the description of the property that we've written in here? Is it my personal integrity? <laughs> is it the integrity of my firm? Is it this? 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 And you recap every item in your agreement. See, when he says, we want to think on it, you've got nothing tangible to get your teeth into. You have got to know what the objection is before you can close on it. And that is your summary question close. Your similar situation story close. Now, when I use the word story, that does not mean, folks, to tell a big fat one. <laughs> a similar situation story close means that you tell, or you, first of all, you define what situation he's in. He says, well... We want to think on it because we really don't have orders yet to transfer and it's just rumor at this point and we want to, you know, just kind of hold up until we really find out what, what's going to happen until we have final orders. So what you do is say, that's fine, sir. Many of my past clients have been in the same situation. See the similar situation story close? See it building here? Many of my past clients have been in the same situation and here's what we do. And then you tell what you did in the other situation and how well it worked out, and you can work the same thing today for this client to solve his problem. You see that? That's your similar situation close. Now, you may want to add a little note to that, that you can also use the deferred plan, what I refer to as my deferred plan. And at a later point, I will discuss with you what my deferred close is. That does parallel just what we talked about just now. The callback close, the callback close. Let me say, first of all, that there is no good callback close. Your callback close goes like this. As an example, I found myself that if I did not get the listing that night, probably 90% chance I wasn't going to get it at all. And I'm saying this to you. If you don't get the listing on your first major presentation, now don't get me wrong, if you just go by and you knock on the door and they say, yes, we're thinking about selling and uh, we're getting orders here in a couple of days or you get a lead on it for sale by owner, whatever it might be. And you make an appointment with them a couple evenings later for a presentation. That's your appointment. When you're coming back on that appointment and if you do not get the listing at that time, I'm saying that there's probably a 90% chance you're not going to get it at all. That's what I found out. I found that if I could come back within about an hour after I had left the property, first of all, let me say, have any of you ever been asked to leave the property? A couple of you. This is one reason you're not getting them. You're not staying long enough. My longest presentation, folks, was six and one half hours. That's right. I got there at six o'clock, 6.30 was the appointment, as an example. Let me tell you the story a little bit that you can further relate with it. I was out knocking doors now, this was when I was new in the business, too. And this was only a couple blocks from my house and the first actual listing that I ever got. 
I was knocking doors going down the street and as will happen when uh, the young man came to the door he had hair down to here someplace grubby looking I knocked on the door he came to the door and I did my dialogue and I says who do you know that might be thinking about selling their property he says well we are but my mother has a friend that's going to handle the whole thing have you heard those now, what would the average salesman do right turn around and leave and say well that one they're already locked up you know I says oh really who is it perhaps I know them you see being a professional in the real estate business I know most people he says well I don't know who it is I said could I talk to your mother please so he went in closed the door here I am by my watch it was 10 minutes I was standing on the doorstep I thought my gosh I'm stood up I almost wanted to ring the doorbell again or knock on the door and I'm waiting I'm waiting I'm waiting now again what would the average salesperson done waiting five minutes or something walk away well, he just slammed the door on me I stood there and then the door opened here's this lady on a couple crutches she had one leg in a cast she says I'm sorry to keep you waiting so long she said my husband and I were in a very serious accident just a few weeks ago I had to have my head shaved so they could stitch up a cut across my skull I wear a wig now I had to get my cast set up right and everything what is it I can help you with you know I felt my gosh she took the trouble to come to the door to talk with me about that then I used my dialogue again a little bit different on her that I used the first time and she says yes as a matter of fact we are going to be selling placing the home on the market here within the next few days but I do have a friend that's going to handle the transaction for me I said can you tell me one thing I said is your interest and objective in selling your home to net the most money possible she says why of course I said fine I'd like to show you how we can do that would tomorrow evening be good to meet with you and your husband say at 630 or would 730 be better and she says well 630 so where do you think I was the next evening at 630 I was there for my appointment he had just gotten home again his leg was in a cat he was a big bruiser he stood about six foot two weighed about 220 pounds and was on two crutches also and a cast on his leg he had his arm bandaged up cuts on their faces and everything bruises well they were really in pretty bad shape so anyway I went into my presentation at that time and 11 o'clock she went to bed at 1 o'clock he went in and says hun I've got to be at work in the morning if you don't sign this during thing that guy's never gonna leave <laughs> let me back up just a little bit probably a couple things that saved me number one he was on the other end of the table he had his leg in a cast and I do believe even as big as he was if he started to come after me I could have gotten out <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to go back into now is my callback close let's say for an example we go on an appointment and we stay as long as feasible as long as before they ask us to move or to leave and and you gotta stay you know people some people say that after you hear the first no write down the time and then stay three hours longer <laughs> and I believe that maybe ten if that's what's gonna take but you've got to stay longer than you're staying now I assure you if you're going to be a top producer now let's say for an example on the callback close that during the presentation or during the visual presentation if you could start seeing that you were not going to be able to close on the listing that evening take a ballpoint pen and I always carry a cross pen with me take a ballpoint pen and while you're seated at the table taken very quietly lay it down by your foot on the floor now you got to be careful if they've got tile or linoleum and they hear it and they say you dropped your pen okay and you don't want that to happen you want to get that pen down there now when you close up your circus tent and you leave I recommend that you go for about an hour about an hour and a half now some things happen in that household in that short span of time I don't know what it is there's something that goes on maybe he's talking to her or she's talking to him saying you know really he wasn't that bad of a guy you know he had some good points whatever it might have been and then miraculously you show up on the doorstep again that evening or that afternoon after your appointment and I recommend you come back that particular evening that you left and soon as he opens the door you start patting your chest saying you know mr. Jones when I was here a while ago I think I left one of my pins 
could we please see if I left it here? And then as soon as he turns to go to the table, where are you? <laughs> right behind him, every step. Now, you're taking your briefcase, your presentation book, the whole thing. As soon as you walk into the kitchen, forget about the pen. You say, you know, when I was here before, I forgot to mention something that I think is imperative to your decision. I'd like to explain it to you. And then sit down, even go through your presentation again. Mention anything. Tell him it's raining in Colorado Springs. Whatever it might be. Something different. I just found out that another house sold over on. Uh, points just went down. Points just went up. Whatever it might be. But explain something to him that something has changed that's imperative to his decision. And then you go right back into your dialogue and your full close again. Now, most probably what will happen on that callback close is that during that period that they have had an hour or so to talk by themselves, they're going to be much more receptive to a closing situation when you come back. And that's the only good callback close that I have ever found to use that works. Major minor question. Now, this is also in your final closing sequence. This surpasses tie downs. This surpasses questions with alternative choice is your major minor question or your final closing question. As an example, let's say that this is the cooperative service agreement, which it is, and this is the table that I'm doing my presentation on. And after we have come to agreement on price and terms and so forth, I would fill it in as we discussed it, and I'd actually say, let me review this for just a moment to double-check myself, and I'd actually go through, and then when you're reviewing this, do it verbally. Say, yes, we've got this in, got this in, got this in, this, because if you let silence exist at that time, it stands for a better opportunity for him to maybe pop you another objection. So don't let silence be during that time that you're reviewing this. And actually look at this, because I have actually found myself that I had forgotten to put in one or two things, maybe a little bit on description, whatever it might be, but you want to be accurate and detailed on this as feasible. Okay, so you say, let me see, this is in, this is in, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. Now here comes your major minor decision. Mr. Jones, now let me back up and set the stage for just a moment. During my presentation... I would come in with two cross ballpoint pens in my pocket. I would come in with one red Parker pen in my pocket. Now, during the course of the presentation itself, what I would do in the normal discussion, just take and lay one of the gold pens over toward the seller. And then a little later during the presentation, just take the red pen and lay it over in the vicinity of the seller. And then I would have the one pen left that I would keep in my hand. Now, as I would turn this around, I would take and point with my index finger to the place where he is to authorize this for me. So I would say, Mr. Jones, would you look this over for me and okay it for me, please? By the way, would you like to use the red pen or the gold? You see, now, if he says, oh, the gold pen, see, I've got that available for him, doesn't it? Now, what I've had people do is say, ah, uh, the gold pen. And then they'd take the pen they'd say, you slick devil. <laughs> but the thing is, it works if you'll do that. Watch me again now, and I'm going to go through the full dialogue, and let me make a couple points about how I would close on a cooperative service agreement. Number one, when I place my hand over here, I lay it flat on the table and point directly at where he is to authorize this for me. Number two, I say, would you look this over and okay it for me, please? Now, notice I've laid my hand, my right hand, on top of my left hand to relax it. Now, when I first developed this clothes and everything, the first time I tried it, I put my hand out like that, and there was about 15 minutes of silence. And you'll notice that after a while that a little three-ounce pen can weigh about four pounds, and my arm get very tired when I use the clothes is just taking rest one hand on top of the other. Now, here's an interesting thing that's happened. How is he going to look that over <laughs> without taking that pen out of my hand? Mr. Jones, would you look this over for me and, and okay it for me right here, please? That's an excellent final close. Then you may extend it with an alternate of choice. By the way, would you like to use the red pen or the gold? That's an excellent close. Your hot potato and piggybacking. Hot potato. Let's say for an example 
by this evening at five o'clock when we're dismissing here, I've got such tremendous rapport with you people that probably about a third of you will want to come up and invite me to dinner. <laughs> you know, let me mention this. A lot of times people think because you're speaking and everything that that night the guy is probably so busy that, you know, there's it, just, just no chance of me asking him to dinner. Let me tell you the truth, folks, that because of most people's attitudes like that, 99% of the time I end up eating by myself and watching Johnny Carson. So what I'm saying is, <laughs> so let's say by this evening about a third of you just, just crowd me, just flood me up here with invitations for dinner this evening. And I've got a standard policy, folks, that when somebody wants to buy my dinner, I let them. <laughs> And I'm kind of the type of old boy that would take an advantage of a situation like that. Let's say you invite me for dinner and we go out here to a really nice restaurant this evening. And I like steak, and I think most of us do. The waiter brings out a nice big juicy steak cooked just the way I like it. And what normally accompanies a nice big steak is a baked potato, right. So normally they just bring those straight from the oven, wrapped in tin foil. And then he cuts it, and he presses the ends, and what comes up out of there? Steam. You have to put that on top later. <laughs> so wouldn't you say this is probably a pretty good indication that that rascal is pretty hot? Now, if I was trying to be a smart boy, which I wouldn't do this, but I saw that hot potato there, and I took it in my hands, and I tossed it back up to the waiter. And it hit him in the hands. One of two things he's going to do with that. First of all, he's probably going to smear it on my face. <laughs> but most probably, he's going to, because it's so hot, he's, he's going to toss it back or drop it. One of the two. And this is a point I want to make, is that in your hot potato closing, if you're touring the property with the clients or with the owners of the property, and you say, Mrs. Jones, do you have a spare key? And she says, we don't want to give out a key. See, the average salesman will say to her, say, what do you mean you don't want to give out a key? How do you expect me to put a lockbox on it? See, so you've just lost. Now, here's your hot potato, tossing it back. She says, we don't want to give out a key. You say, you don't want to give out a key? Let her defend her position. She says, we don't want a for sale sign on the property. See, so the average salesman will say, how do you think we're going to expose it to the public if we don't have a for sale sign? Don't fight her. Remember what your objective is. What is your main objective there? Number one is to get the listing. We have some different major objectives. In this situation is, the first objective is to get the listing. Well, you can go in there and fight with them all evening and end up without it. How many of you have ever spent a commission on a listing you didn't get? It's pretty hard to do, isn't it? So number one, we do have to have an agreement with that seller to sell the property. In order to do that, what we have to do, number one, is to get the cooperative service agreement. Don't fight with them. When she says, we don't want open house, you don't want open house? When she says, we don't want multiple listing tour, what do you say? You don't want multiple listing tour? Let me jot that down. Now, you can come back the next day on the front porch after you've got the listing, jumping up and down saying, we really need to get a lockbox on it. It would be most convenient if we got the for sale sign on, it would be really nice if we could hold this lovely home open. Then you can start servicing the listing. But until you get it, let them win a little bit. Piggybacking is an excellent method of building rapport with a client. Let's say that when we come in on our initial interview with the client that evening, when we first come in, we probably want to sit down for a few minutes and just talk with them casually. Not a lot of time. I'll tell you about how much time in a little bit, but just discuss very briefly with them where do you work, where are you moving, first one thing and another. And then as you start through touring the property with the owner, well, let's say this is a hallway here and we're walking down the hallway. We've just came from the master bedroom previewing it and so forth. And we're walking along. Maybe the owners are in front of you or behind you and you just stop and say, that's interesting. What's interesting is going to be their response that you work building airplanes, that you're an electrical engineer, that you're a civil engineer, that whatever it is, is interesting. Now, how does that make that client feel? 
very important. Makes him feel good. Now, if you get him talking in the presence of his wife, do most husbands like to look good in the eyes of their wife? You better. <laughs> like one guy asked me one time, says, how often should you tell or when should you tell your mate that you love him? And I say, before somebody else does. <laughs> If you get him talking to you about how great his job is, what is he accomplishing through you? Right. These are things that he's been wanting for five years to tell the little woman about how great of an engineer he is, how great of a pilot he is, whatever it might be, how great he stamps out gaskets or bottle tops or whatever it might be, that he's the best that there is. Now you've given him a vehicle. Can you also use this on the wife? Well, of course you can. Asking the husband, through the husband, you can find out things about the wife. This is a tremendous area of building rapport. Now, to continue with the piggybacking, when you know where he works and you say, how long have you worked there? What got you interested in that job? With piggybacking, what you're taking is his answer and creating another question in that same area. Tremendous for building rapport. Absolutely tremendous. Final objection. What do we do when we hear an objection? Now, a lot of people say, ignore it, bypass it, act like you didn't hear it, whatever it might be. And I think maybe 20 years ago, when some of those techniques were developed, that might have worked. But in today, people are much better versed, much better informed, much more knowledgeable because of the communication and great educational facilities that we have today than they were some years ago. Now, I'm sure that there's going to be some frivolous objections and there's probably some times that you could just say, well, we'll cover that later in the program. I'm glad you brought it up. Compliment him with that. Rather than just trying to ignore it continuously all the time, because if he's got four or five objections and he keeps bringing them up and you keep ignoring them, you're not really communicating. And communication is the name of the game. How do you answer an objection? Number one, you isolate the objection. Question it is number two. Question the objection, and then look a little puzzled, is number three. So when he says to you, well, Roger, we like your program, but we've got this friend in the business. Now, if I were to answer that objection and overcome you've got a friend in the business, what can happen? He may pop another objection. Then I nail that one down, he pops another one. See, what happened was if we handled that way, what started out as being a battle of wits ends up being a battle of half-wits. <laughs> so what we need to do is, number one, is isolate the objection, question it, and look a little defeated or a little puzzled. And the way we do that is say, just to clarify my thinking, what you're telling me is you've got a friend in the business. Is that right? See, he doesn't want to hurt your feelings. He's going to say, yes, that's right, Roger. Is that the only thing standing between us today? And if he says yes... What's happened? He's dead. Because then all you have to do is overcome one objection. And he said that's the only thing standing between you. Hasn't he? Now, another approach to that is when he has the objection that he says, well, Roger, we've got this friend in the business. Another way to handle it is, in addition to that, is there anything else standing between us today? He says, yes, let me write it down. He says this, 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 and this. You may have a list of three or four different things. And in addition, is there anything else standing between us today? You've got to get a total commitment of isolation from that client that that's the only thing that's standing between you.